I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. Uh, my crystal ball tells me that you guys really, really want to learn more about Betaflight 3.2. So, who am I to deny? Give the people what they want. We're going to take a closer look at Betaflight 3.2, look at a couple of the killer features, and uh, show you how to enable them. Yeah. Betaflight 3.2 is getting closer and closer to an actual release candidate. Not an official release, but actual official release is still scheduled, I think, for sometime in October. That's like two months from now. Yeah, two months from now. But a release candidate, which is the first, like, hey, maybe there's no bugs in this. I, that's how I would describe it anyway. That's coming real soon. And so all of you guys who have been holding off on installing it because it's just... To like totally unstable, well, maybe you'll have a slightly more stable version to work with. And I'd like to show you some of the things that are coming because some people are installing it already, you daring devils, you. And uh, you're running into some problems that aren't really problems, okay? So let's let's take a look. Let's find out more. Here I am in the Betaflight configurator, and yes, I have downloaded from GitHub the experimental Betaflight configurator. If you're running into problems with Betaflight 3.2, it might be just because you're using the old version of the configurator that doesn't work with 3.2. Uh, notice my configurator version here is 3.1.2. Uh, by the way, that's different from the Betaflight version. There's the Betaflight code, and there's the configurator, and they have separate versions, and yeah, that's a little confusing. So the the Betaflight version is 3.2, the configurator version is 3.1.2. If you don't have, if you have 3.1.1, yeah, that's why you're having problems. Sorry about that. I try, dropped a screw. So let's go ahead and connect, and we'll take a look at what's new in here. If we look at the ports tab, one of the things that is new, if we go to peripherals, you'll see that run cam split is there in the peripherals. What does that mean? What that means is that there's they're working on the ability to have Betaflight control the run cam split to do things like start and stop recording, erase the SD card. I don't know what kind of features, but that kind of features that you might like to do remotely without having to actually push buttons and navigate that awfully kind of annoying two button menu. Well, I have no idea what the status of that is going to be, but it, here it is, the first official recognition that at least they're working on that. I'm not even sure this is slated for 3.2, frankly, uh, but they are working on it. Here in configuration, one thing you'll notice here is that the configurator has been reshuffled a little bit. A few things aren't where you might expect them to be. If we go down, we can see that... The craft name personalization it used to be down here. Now it's been moved over there. Likewise for the camera angle. The, ser the receiver stuff is here. Uh, in the clean flight configurator, the receiver stuff is, this is actually on the receiver tab, uh, where you probably would expect it to be. <laughs> but in beta flight, it's still here in the configuration tab. Oh, well. Everything you're seeing here is preliminary, by the way. Many of it will change. And normally I would wait until freaking October to do this video. But my crystal ball tells me you guys really want to see this stuff so here is a really cool feature that has until now been available only in the command line that's right you know how annoying it is when you plug the quad into usb and the beeper starts going off well you've you've actually hey dorothy you've had the ruby slippers with you the whole time there actually has been an ability to turn that off for a long time but it's only accessible via the command line and most people probably didn't know it existed you can control when your beeper is is beeping and one of the things you want to look for is usb you turn that off and anytime you're plugged into usb your beeper won't beep oh that's pretty sweet you can also turn off any of these other beeps if you don't want to hear them up to you Here's the features, and one of the features we see here is anti-gravity. So we have the ability to turn anti-gravity mode on and off uh, as a feature. So it's not a mode, it's a feature. Feature means it's on all the time, regardless of what your stick or switch position is. Uh, I, I, I think this should just be on by default. I kind of don't know why it isn't. It doesn't really have any downsides, and it has many, many upsides. Oh, and then, of course, we have the dynamic filter. A dynamic filter may be the most exciting thing in Betaflight 3.2. Dynamic notch filtering basically means that the filters are much more tailored to the where your noise is. You don't have to manually tune them, which many of you didn't do anyway. This is one that you really want to try to turn on if at all possible. Now, it's off by default because some quads still don't respond to it well. And hopefully as time passes, maybe even before October, it will get better and better. 
Um, the work, the approach that you want to take though is that you turn this on and you see if you get hot motors. And you probably won't because you're increasing the amount of filtering and that usually means you, you get worse performance but you get cooler motors. So you're going to turn this on and you're going to save. And then you're going to go over to the PID tuning tab and you're going to go to the filter settings and you're going to remove the gyro notch filter. You're going to just set that to zero. And when you do that, then you're going to go fly again and you're going to see if you got hot motors. And if you do, you go back, go back to default, turn the dynamic filter off, just leave it alone. If you don't have hot motors, you're going to turn off gyro notch number two, go fly. If you get hot motors, Go back to, hey, write down what that number, see how I, hang on. There we go. Write that number down. Take a screenshot. Don't email me and ask me, what's the default? If you do lose the default, here's a little tip for you. You can just switch profiles. So switch from profile one to profile two, and you can always get back the default values. And then go back to profile one, which is probably the one you're working off of, and, and put them back in again. So you've disabled gyro notch one. You've disabled gyro notch two, and then you're going to disable the D-term notch, like so. And at that point, that's supposedly where the real magic is with the dynamic notch. That, when you have all of the static notches disabled and the dynamic notch working, people, a lot of people say, oh, holy cow, this thing flies good. We'll see what your experience is. If at any point, again, your motors get hot, stop, back up. Do not proceed. You will. You can smoke a motor. Another new thing in 3.2 is that the the power and battery settings have been broken out into their own uh, into their own tab. So things like the voltage meter source, the current meter source, the the battery warning levels, the uh, and the scaling, those have all been moved into their own tab. We can also see the power state here. So we can see. By the way, my battery is not connected. But here, watch. There you go. See four cell. Yeah, 15.6 volts, etc., etc. Here in the PID tuning tab, we can see that the trend of moving things out of the CLI and into the configurator has continued. Notice that anti-gravity gain can now be configured from the GUI and the anti-gravity threshold can be configured from the GUI. I do have a video about anti-gravity, but basically the gist of it is that if when you move the throttle real fast, the copter pitches up and down or yaws left and right, then raise the anti-gravity gain. You should generally leave the anti-gravity threshold alone because it, it controls how fast you have to move the throttle to activate the anti-gravity boosting of the I-term. It's a little hard to tune that, but if you if you find that you're moving the throttle like slowly and the copter is still doing the nose pitching, maybe you want to uh, decrease the anti-gravity threshold that'll cause anti-gravity to kick in more often. In general, I think most people aren't going to be able to tune this very effectively because most people don't understand really what anti-gravity does in the first place, so it's a little tricky to tune that. Here in the receiver tab, we now have the ability to put in, this is min check and this is max check. <laughs> this is such an important parameter, we've had to go to the CLI to get those, and now we don't have to, and that's super nice. There's a whole lot new in the OSD. The OSD has gotten much, much more mature. There's a lot more information that can be shown on the OSD, for example, like the average cell voltage. So if you want to land at 3.8 volts per cell, instead of you having to go, okay, 15 volts divided by four is, you know, you can just see the average cell voltage if that's what you want to see. There's also some interesting things here, ESC temperature and ESC RPM. That's for the ESC telemetry feature that will be coming soon with BL Heli 32. And in fact, KISS already does it, although I'm not 100% sure that Betaflight supports reading those values. So basically the ESC can report its own temperature and this is the good one, the motor RPM, the actual motor RPM not the throttle value that the flight controller is asking for, which is what we currently log, but the actual RPM. And I have so much potential to get useful data out of that. Uh, you know, right now, uh, guys like Quad McFly measure prop transition times. That is, when you move the throttle, how fast does the motor change the speed of the prop? And they do that on the bench with an attack, a tachometer and, you know, all that stuff, but you really can't do it in the air. But now you will be able to do it in the air to, to be able to see those transition times and get this real-time tuning data. This is huge, and it's really, it's really a shocking oversight. Imagine they're trying to tune a car's engine without knowing the wheel speed or the engine RPM, right? That's a, what we've been doing until now. It's great. There's another feature of the OSD that is so exciting to me. 
and it is this. This is the stats screen that's shown at the end of a flight, and look at this. The black box log number is recorded in the DVR at the end of the flight. It's like Christmas and my birthday all at once. <laughs> What this means is that when you finish the day flying and you've got 57 DVR videos and 2,800 uh, log files on your SD card, figuring out which one is which, you don't have to... What you do now is you load up the video and then you load up the log file and you kind of look at the sticks and you go, nope, not that one. Now you'll actually just know the log number. Now you'll notice this is set to zero. And the reason for that is that this is a data flash chip not an SD card. And for a data flash chip, there is no log number. The data flash just logs the flights internally. So yet another reason why SD card is the way to go if you want to be doing serious black box logging. I guess the argument could be if you have a data flash chip, you're only going to have five or seven flights anyway before the chip fills up. So you don't really need this feature. This is so massive to me. Now, the last thing I want to show you is in the CLI. This is the crash recovery feature. This is the reward for you guys who are still watching at the end of the video. You're going to know about this and nobody else is. You find out about the crash recover feature. Where is it? It hasn't been anywhere in here. It'll be in the release notes. But for those of you who have installed Betaflight 3.2 already, you really wouldn't find out about it unless you do a dump. And I recommend this. This is really getting down into the nerd stuff. But by looking through the config dump, you can find new features that you didn't know existed because they're going to be here in the config dump. So as I scroll up here, one thing you'll see is set horizon tilt expert mode and horizon tilt effect. What is that? Well, let me show you how to find out for yourself. I don't know. I didn't know a half hour ago when I started making this video. I'm going to show you how. What I'm going to do is I'm going to search for beta flight GitHub to find the beta flight GitHub repo. This is where all the code is, where the developers do their work. And this is also where they talk about the new features that they're putting into Betaflight. So we'll go to, uh, not releases, I don't want to be in releases, but it doesn't really matter. As long as I'm in the Betaflight GitHub repo, I can search in this repository, and I'm just going to search, what was it called? Horizon Tilt Effect. So I'm going to search for Horizon Tilt Effect. And here we've got a pull request, which is adding the horizon tilt effect command. Oh, perfect. I think this is a pull request. And if we read, let's see what it says. This pull request has been superseded by 2750. So we probably should go look at 2750 since this one has been superseded. But let's get there in a minute because this probably still gives us some valuable information about what the designer was thinking about this command. This modification adds two new commands, horizon tilt effect and horizon tilt mode, which control the effect of the current inclination has on self-leveling in the horizon flight mode. With the existing horizon mode, the strength of self-leveling is solely dependent on the stick position. This is problematic when trying to do maneuvers like large loops and fast forward flight. I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but the gist of it is that horizon tilt effect makes it easier to do inverted and slow looping moves in horizon mode. Makes horizon mode fly better. And you can read all about it just by searching on the GitHub repo. That's your Teach Amanda Fish tip for today. As we continue to scroll up, we do find a few other things. This is interesting. PID sum limit and PID sum limit yaw. Those stand out to me as a PID tuner is potentially something interesting. ITERM wind up. That's interesting. And, oh, this is the one that you guys want to know about, crash recovery. So crash recovery is a new feature in Betaflight 3.2. And again, let's go ahead to the GitHub repo and just try, see if we can figure out what it is. Let's search for crash recovery, which is the name of the feature. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to find a pull request, which is this icon, because a pull request is, hey, this feature's done. Let's integrate it uh, and see how it works. And these other things are issues and uh, reporting bugs with it. They can be useful, but... Let's take a look at the added and experimental crash detection and recovery pull request. And let's see. There are six new parameters added to the CLI to control this for crash detection. Yes, that's right. Crash recovery is a feature that detects when the quadcopter is crashing and kicks it into auto level mode just temporarily to get it back right side up again. So you're flying as fast as you can and you hit that air gate and you hit a branch. Boy, the copter's upside down. It's spinning like crazy. Crash recovery will detect that is happening and level the quad out 
and then give control back to you. How freaking cool is that? So we can see here the parameters that pertain to crash recovery and figure out how to use them. Well, let's see, take a D-term crash value, gyro crash value, crash time, crash recovery angle, and crash recovery rate. A cra oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Martin Button. Here's a description of how it works. A crash is detected if crash D threshold and crash G threshold are exceeded and the motor outputs are saturated. So what this means is that the D term and the, G, and the gyro are exceeding a certain magnitude and the motor outputs are at full. So the theory there is that if the motors haven't gone to full, then the quadcopter probably isn't crashing. But usually when the quadcopter is crashing, at least one motor will be driven to full. They call that saturation. And, uh, and, and the copter still won't be able to recover. And then the D threshold and the G threshold pertain to the PIDs and how fast the copter is spinning. One thing to keep in mind, and this is a gotcha that has been, people have been asking me about, is the D threshold and the G threshold are tuned for the default rate. And the default rates are around, well, 667 degrees per second. If you, like me, are running high rates, I run almost double those rates, or I'm at around 1150, 1200 degrees per second on pitch and roll, you will activate crash recovery just when you do a flip or a roll. Your copter will spin fast enough under normal conditions to make the flight controller think that you're having a crash. And people have said to me, man, this Betaflight 3.2 is sure is screwed up. I did a, a snap roll and the copter just turned right back over again. And I said, no, no, that's on purpose. So you can enable this feature, well, presumably by just typing set crash recovery equals on, and you can adjust the D threshold and the G threshold, especially the G threshold is the one you'll want to adjust. You can see here the G threshold is 400. Presumably that's degrees per second. That's a little, I guess it needs the saturation as well. That's a little weird because the default rates will exceed 400 degrees per second. But if you're, if you're trying to play with this and it's doing it when you don't want it to, try raising the crash G threshold to something higher. It looks like it's currently about two thirds of the max rate, maybe you should try try that as a starting point. So that is your preview look at Betaflight 3.2. Remember, everything in this video is preliminary. We haven't even got a release candidate yet, but probably a lot of this stuff will go into the final release unchanged and everything will be mostly just bug testing and a wider scale testing to make sure there's no gotchas before the final release. August 1st is the tentative date for the first release candidate. That will be the point where the configurator is supposed to update, as I understand it, and you will no longer need to do all this rigmarole with downloading from Jenkins and, and downloading the experimental configurator. You'll just get it from the Chrome app just like you normally do. And uh, yeah, so leave any questions you got down in the comments and uh, happy flying.